Hi, welcome back again to the Ivory Tower Collections. We have before us another Intellivision 2. They seem to be popping up quite a bit lately in my videos, as my last video I released was also in regards to the Intellivision 2 console. However, today's video will more heavily focus on this console, and more specifically, it's going to be talking about this once again. Yes, you've seen this before, as I also just did a video on this recently. This is the uh, RGB board designed and created by the Crayon King, known as the Orange Peel Board. In today's video, we are going to be installing this board into a Model 2 in television. So, let's get to it. Here is the board. I'm not going to go into too much detail on this this time as I've already covered it again in my previous installation video when I put one of these into the Intellivision Model 1. But just to quickly go over what comes in the kit, you have the RGB board here. It will also come with a set of RCA jacks, so you'll have your, your yellow, white, red RCA jacks. It will also come with an 8-pin mini DIN panel mount jack including a breakout PCB that can be used on the back of it for easier solder work. It will also come with an S-Video panel mount jack and also a breakout PCB. It will include two additional smaller little IC boards. And these are what we call QSBs or quick solder boards. There are two of them provided because one is designed for use with the stick IC chip and the other one is designed for the U10 color graphics IC chip. It will also have a switch. Now to quickly go over what all of these are for, the different output jacks are present because this board does provide both composite, RGB, and S-Video outputs, making it a very versatile board. And again, the QSBs are provided just for that, quick solder boards, to make it easier in installing the board itself. And then the switch is provided so that you can add it optionally if you want, so that you have the ability to control the two different palettes that are programmed onto the RGB board. With that out of the way, let's talk about the tools that we're going to need. Similar to the previous install, we are going to need a few things. We're going to need our trusty number two Phillips screwdriver. Again, this is pretty much always a staple for things. You might need some uh, small pliers or perhaps some electrical tweezers. I tend to kind of use both sometimes in my installation, so you might need those. You're going to need some side cutters. This is used for trimming off leads and wires. You are also going to need, of course, some length of wire. You're going to need much longer than this. So for this installation, you're probably going to need anywhere from between maybe 8 to about 12 length, uh, strands of wire. I would say you probably want to have at least a foot. You're probably not going to need that much, but you know, it never hurts to have more wire than to not have enough. You're also going to need some good wire strippers. You might need a little bit of desoldering braid and perhaps some Kapton tape might be handy. You want to make sure that you have a good soldering iron that you like to use in addition to some good quality solder. And of course, nothing's complete without making sure that we have a means to clean up our messes. So I've got my alcohol here. This is my good 99.9% grade electronics grade alcohol, a uh, old toothbrush, and some Q-tips. Let's crack open that in television too and talk about some and talk about the installation and where things will go. To open up a Model 2 in television is actually very simple. This is one of the simplest consoles to actually get into and to open up. If you turn it over on the bottom, there are only two screws that have to come out on the bottom. They are located over here, next similar or very close to where the cartridge input port is, and in the opposite corner over here. These screws are the same length and the same thread, so you do not need to worry about keeping these uh, separate. They can go on either spot. Once you have those two screws loosened up, the entire cover will now essentially just lift right off. Now, obviously, to do today's installation work, we're going to need to access the main board both above and below, so we're going to need to remove it from the rest of the housing. Very simple. There's just four Phillips screws left. We've got two on opposite sides of the cartridge port here. They help to anchor it in place. These actually have like, uh, they're kind of flared or they have little flanges built into them, like washers as they were. And then the other two are right here in the center of the main board at the bottom and at the top. As 
at that point, the whole board will start to lift up. You may have to get your finger under one side of it to kind of pop it off the, the mounting boss posts around the cartridge port. And then you're going to need to start to slide it towards the cartridge port area a little bit as you start to lift up on it. And the whole main board will come right out. Okay, so what are our primary focus as far as today's installation goes? Well, just to help orientate and identify a few things on top, I am going to mention some things. For starters, although this does include the 8-pin mini DIN panel mount, which, you know, you can pretty much just punch a hole in the case anywhere, epoxy this in, and, and install it where you want, today's install is actually going to end up using one of my 9-pin mini DIN setups instead. And the reason for this is because the owner of this Intellivision already has 9-pin RGB cables designed for Sega use in Sega systems, so that's how we're going to wire up this RGB setup today. One thing that I have already done is I've also removed the light pipe that goes around the power LED. I would recommend this. You don't want this to break and snap off, so all you have to do is just release the catch on one side on the bottom, pull the light pipe off. Because I'm going to be using this 9-pin mini den today, is we're actually going to be removing the RF modulator completely, and where the output was for the RF modulator is where I will actually end up installing the RGB jack to come out of the case. This way, there's really no additional holes that have to be drilled for the RGB port. It also allows me to repurpose the use of the channel select switch for the pallet switching. Now, the two chips that we want to identify on this board, this is the stick right here. It's almost in the dead center, right, uh, right ahead of the power supply right here. But this is one of the IC chips that we can use one of our QSBs or quick solder boards for right here to help us in getting all of our wiring in place. The other chip I mentioned is U10 the color IC chip, and that's located just right here, just right next to where the stick is. So either one of these can be used to help in setting things up. But of course, the QSBs are going to be de are designed to be installed on the bottom side of the PCB to be soldered up and put into place. So what about the RGB board itself here? Well, it's a fairly large size board, and like a lot of other installations that I've spoke about, you want to make sure that you have this board orientated in such a way that your inputs have as short as run as possible, but also, logically, your outputs will fit as well. It is technically possible to essentially set this board on top of some of the IC chips. Again, I'm not a fan of that. For a number of reasons, in this particular installation, these two IC chips are actually in sockets. These two are not. This one's in a socket. This one isn't. So I would only really be able to affix it onto these IC chips here because they have the maximum height. And then I might run into a clearance issue whenever I go to put the top cover back on. Additionally, these chips get hot. They don't get as hot as they did on the Model 1 systems, but they still get hot. So really, the board setup and design is designed to be installed from the other side. So let's take a look at that. I've now flipped the board over, and as far as where to install this, again, to take a look at the board's layout and design, down here along the bottom edge here, as the way this board is currently oriented, this is the output side, and up here is the input pads. So honestly, what I'm going to do is I'm going to trim up this area here of any stray leads that are poking through quite a bit, just to try to give me as much flat space as I can, so that I can actually mount the RGB board on the bottom here. So that leads me with, what about the chips that I have to solder my wiring to? Well, again, you have two QSBs that are provided for this purpose. So, depending on which one you want to use, let me show you where they go. The color IC chip pins are located right along here. Due to the way that we're looking at this board essentially upside down and backwards, pin 1 is actually located right here. So to install this QSB board, you would need to lay it down like that. However, be advised, it's not going to lay perfectly flat because there are some leads poking through here. I believe this is a couple of resistors on the other side of the board here. So you would need to trim the legs of these resistors down and try to make it as flush as you can across here, just so this will sit a little bit better. While Crayon King has designed his boards that without any really exposed traces on the bottom side, it could still be a possibility something could get scratched or scraped or whatever, and it might cause a problem. So, you know, it might not be a bad idea to use some small pieces of Kapton tape just to kind of put in between the pins, just to make sure. What if you want to use the stick? Well, again, the stick is located right here, and honestly, this is the route I'm going to take today. Because I plan to put the board like this, 
That means that my input side is right here, and because of that, the shortest distance for that is actually at the stick. So similar to the way it was on the Color IC chip U10, we are also looking at it upside down and backwards, so pin 1 is actually located right here, which means that pins 20 and 21 are located here. Now, on the QSB for the stick, Crayon King is actually labeled where pins 20 and 21 go. So in this particular case, this is going to sit really nicely, just like that. And in fact, this area is already pretty flush as it is. I don't think I'm going to really have to do anything to it. It's pretty smooth through here already. And then be able to solder it down into place like that. RGB board will sit around there. I have pretty short runs to route my input lines to. And then my output wires will also be fairly close to the RF section here making those a fairly short distance as well for the uh, output jack that will be installed on the other side. I do want to make a note about something. There is a, a pad here for 5 volt and ground. You can use these if you want, but I would recommend instead that you use different points on the board. So what I'm going to do instead is probably just choose another random point on the board to scrape away to, to attach the ground to. There's lots of ground around here. And then the 5 volts, a really good spot to get that from, is right here. There's this big, thick trace that runs right here, and you've got these two leads that stick up through here. These actually come off the power supply board on the other side, and this is 5 volts. So again, when I put this board into place, I'll be able to run my 5 volt and ground pretty close to these pins here, and then I'll route everything else where it would go to the pads on the stick. In preparing for the installation of this, there's really only one major task I'm going to have to worry about in this install, and that is removing the RF modulator. It's actually not that difficult to remove the RF modulator, provided you have the right tools for doing this. You're going to need your soldering iron set to a pretty decent high temperature, and the reason for that is because you've got these anchor points that hold the RF modulator into place. You also, of course, have the actual signal lines that go to the RF modulator for the video on the audio and power. But those are just standard vias, not that big a deal. But these anchors can be kind of a bear. This is where you're going to need to get your desoldering braid to apply down on top of these in order to remove the solder around these. The good news is that the actual RF modulator itself is not soldered onto that. It is only soldered onto these anchor points. So that's going to make it pretty easy to actually remove it once you get all that solder off of there. So uh, yeah, I'm just going to get the solder removed. Be right back. I've now got the RF modulator fully removed and I've cleaned up all of the solder joints from the desolder work. So at this point, I'm actually ready to go ahead and begin installing the actual RGB stuff. Now, what we're going to do here first is I will probably start with the installation of putting in my 9-pin mini den. Now, I actually have PCB mounts that I use for this uh, to help raise the uh, AV jack up off a little bit higher just to make it easier to insert cables into. So uh, that's the part I'm going to go through next. I've now gone ahead and attached on the 9-pin mini den where it needs to go using my little PCB mount board here just to help give me some extra height as well as additional anchor and stability to the board. Again, the mini jack is installed in an upside down fashion which some people don't like, some people don't really mind, but it's pretty common. You know, when you've got the standard cable like this, it just plugs in like that. 
So, still nice and tight fit, should work good. Here we are with a little quick fitment. You can see that with that little mount PCB board inside that the mini den jack pretty much sits exactly where it needs to. Almost dead center and at the perfect height. At this point, I'm ready to go ahead and start installing the actual RGB board into place. Again, I'm gonna set it more or less like this. But my plan will be to essentially try and widen the opening here for this anchor. And I should be able to run most of my output wires for the RGB through that opening, just so I don't have to worry about it overlapping or anything to that effect. I'll have to do some minor trim work. There's a couple of leads kind of poking up a little higher here than I would like, but uh, it's not that big a deal. So uh, let's get started on that. I now have all of my wires from the RGB board ran to my mini DIN connector that I need for video. However, one thing is left to discuss and that's audio. It's actually very easy to get audio from the Model 2 in television. If you look right here, you'll see three vias all combined together. This is audio. So all you really have to do to get audio to your mini DIN jack or to external RCAs is just to run a wire from any of these three vias back over to where it needs to go. Now, because this is a nine pin mini den used for Sega systems, we have both a dedicated mono as well as left and right pins. What I typically do to make sure that audio is present on all speakers, regardless of which cable type is used, is I will run my audio wire and make sure that it is actually attached to all three of these points. I now have the bulk of all of the wiring done that I need. So let me just quickly summarize and review what's been connected to what. So on the input side, I have my five volt and my ground coming off of different points off the main board itself to provide the power and ground connection needed for the RGB board. Although you can't see it very well, here's where I pulled five volts from. It's just between, like I said earlier in the video, there are two leads coming through from the power supply that go to the five volt rail. I actually have the ground attached right here. After that, you have your clock signal and then you have the A, B, C, D, E connections. So the clock signal is actually just attached off of the, off the pad marked clock off the QSB coming off the stick. A is also the same way. So I've got a connection from A to A, B to B, C to C, D to D, and then E to E. These last two wires I just ran on the other side, just for funsies, I guess. On the output side, what I've got here is I've got a wire for five volts and sync, but because this has been wired for use with a Sega Genesis RGB cable, I'm actually using the blue, green, and red bypass pads up here for my red, green, and blue signals. That's why those are going off over to this side. You may be wondering what this brown wire was all about. Well, 
This brown wire goes to one of the pads of the coal select section. That is actually the color selector switch that you can wire in here to select between the two different pallets. The way that this switch works is that it's just a signal that's either grounded or it's not grounded. Because of this, one of these pads is actually already tied to ground. And we can prove that by setting my meter here to continuity. And again, one of these pads, this one right here, is tied to ground. It's the one that's directly below the C and the O and the L. That just means that the only thing you really need to do is to run one wire off of the other pad, which is under the SEL portion of the silk screen, to another point that attaches to ground when you flip a switch. Well, as it turns out, the channel select switch up here is perfect for this. If you remove the RF modulator, all the channel select switch does is in one position, it's basically nothing. It's just an open circuit. In the other position, it actually applies five volts to ground through the RF modulator and enables it to switch to the other channel. Well, if you remove the RF modulator from the Intellivision, then that plus five volt signal is never actually generated and used. So what ends up happening is you end up having an empty trace that no longer does anything with the RF modulator removed. It's actually attached to the center pin right here. So all I had to do was just attach my wire, the other pad from Color Select, to one of these two unused vias off this trace. And now what will happen is, since this one's tied to ground, when you have the switch in one position, it will enable the color palette for one color, put it in the other position, and it will remain open as this pin does not connect to anything, and it will be the other color. So in a way, this is pretty cool because you really only need to run one wire to the color select palette switch in order to make it function. If we take it over to the other side, we can discuss about all the different connections I have coming off of the RGB. So all of the red, green, and blue on the bypass pads run to the various red, green, and blue as needed on the 9-pin mini DIN, in addition to my 5 volts in my sync line. I also have the audio connected up, as I specified just a little bit, coming off of one of those three vias over here to the three pads for audio on this mini DIN here. Or if you have an 8-pin mini DIN, it would be connected to the left and right. And then the other wire I have left, the last one here, this yellow wire, actually connects to the composite video input on the 9-pin mini DIN. And the reason for that is pretty simple. That enables compatibility with HD retrovision cables or if you wanted to, you could use a standard set of Sega composite AV cables and still get composite video output that way. So really all that's left to do at this point is to pop this thing back in real quick and give it a test. I now have the Intellivision essentially put back together here with a proper Sega Genesis RGB cable attached going into my RetroTINK 2X and into my LCD monitor here via HDMI. So here we go, let's test it out. We're gonna go ahead and power on the console And there is the LTO flash menu, looking good. I apologize, this monitor can't accommodate a 4.3 aspect on HDMI, but it's enough to at least be able to see that everything's working. Let's see if we have audio. So, thank you again for hanging out with me today here at the Ivory Tower. Hopefully this uh, video tutorial was uh, helpful for you on installing one of Crayon King's orange peel boards into your Intellivision Model 2. I'll catch you guys another time. Thanks.